although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. See, the truth was that not everybody was going to Jesus. I think physically, John was probably the much more imposing figure. Would would you agree? Like, probably much more interesting to look at. I mean, the guy had a satchel, we talked about this, full of bugs that he dipped in honey. Big hairy dude. Big beard. Probably could have led worship at El Paso Bible Church. Big beard. (laughs) big beard like this huh Jacob yeah I envy that beard I can't grow it mine comes in half gray so off it came he's not there yet right John had been told right everybody's going to Jesus Uh, the truth was not that exactly it wasn't even that Jesus had more disciples than John I don't even think that's true at this point in his ministry but the truth was, the, the iota, the nugget of truth that started in the, in the Christian was that Jesus did have a higher rate of disciple making than John did. John was increased, Jesus was increasing his following faster than John was at this point, meaning that John was kind of plateauing a little bit, if we were to use church growth uh, terms here. He was plateauing a little bit, and, and Jesus was now gaining on John. In his ministry growth, which, as we've said before, was a problem for everybody except John the Baptist. John knew exactly what was going on. John knew exactly what had to happen, what he was there for. He never made a mistake about that. Making his own disciples, John was, it was intended to grow Jesus' ministry. He said that, I must decrease and he must increase. But you may recall, now John doesn't record this conversation to my knowledge, but you may recall from other records of John encountering the Pharisees as he's baptizing, (laughs) right? You remember? Something about you brood of vipers? Yeah? Who warned you to flee the wrath to come, he said to him, the Pharisees specifically. Uh, The encounter wasn't all that productive, you know? In fact, I've baptized a few people. You know what I've never done? Called them a brood of vipers and refused to baptize them. But it doesn't appear that John baptized the Pharisees. We're not told that he did. That would be pretty climactic, right? That would be kind of the apex of John's ministries if, if the Pharisees could humble themselves to the point to be baptized by the lowly John the baptizer who baptized people in the muddy ditch of the river that he did. Wouldn't that be something? Don't you think that would be recorded in there somewhere, if that was the case? I think it would be. John said some pretty judgmental things to those Pharisees. I mean, unless you consider, are, are you, do you like snakes? There are people that like snakes. I'm more like, I take the more like the Indiana Jones perspective, you know. Snakes, why do they have to be snakes? I shoot snakes, I chop snakes' heads off, I, I do, I don't like snakes. It feels something like about Genesis 3, you know, I just don't like enmity between you and the seed of the woman. Don't like snakes. You brood of vipers, is what he said. So Jesus hears this, he hears Again, an anonymous rumor. (laughs) He hears that the Pharisees know that his rate of disciple-making is surpassing John's. And we're not sure about what their their presumptions about that truth are. Uh, We're not sure what the Pharisees think about that truth. All we know is what they know. And John seems to have refused to baptize them, telling me that this group of Pharisees were unbelievers. We talked about that. Maybe you remember that John was not going around just 
slap dunking people that had no relationship to the Messiah, that hadn't believed in him. He was preparing people for the earthly kingdom. We talked at length about that, that neither Jesus nor John would do that. John also makes it clear that Jesus wasn't doing the baptizing, that his disciples were doing it. I think there's a very simple explanation for that, and I think it's one of the themes of, of chapter 4 here, that I think Jesus is demonstrating concern that the people not be confused as to what justifies, what declares somebody righteous, what grants them eternal life. He wants them not to be confused that it is belief alone, that it is faith alone in Jesus that justifies. Y'all are not confused on that front, right? I hope not, because otherwise I need to change my tactic. I'm about as clear as I can possibly be. How do you go to heaven when you die? You believe in Jesus. Nothing less, nothing more will do it. That is the only thing. Whereas baptism is part of something, in my, my understanding, of what we call discipleship. I actually don't like that, that word even because, well, Paul doesn't use it. It's a little telling, but we call it the process of maturity. I prefer to talk about maturing. But in Jesus' earthly ministry, it was. He was making disciples. He was disciple-making. And he wanted to keep the distinction clear between what justifies, what grants eternal life, what is regeneration, and what is maturity, right? This is maturity, not birth. But once Jesus knew that they knew this, this fact, he moves on. How do you like that? How many people, how many of his followers, you well, you ought to stand up to those Pharisees. You ought not to take any of that garbage from those legalists. Nah. Well, there's a time for confronting them. There's a time for that. <laughs> They've been confronted. Haven't they? The stinking brood of vipers. They've been confronted. They have been warned repeatedly. In fact, John understood that. That's why he said, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Because I didn't. But what are you doing here? You've gotten a warning somehow. They've been confronted. But they don't believe. And so we know from John's own words that they remain under judgment. They are all judged already because they didn't believe. They remain there. We also know that Jesus did not come to judge. He came to save. Right, y'all were here last week, right? I don't see many heads nodding. We know that. That's what John says. The, the son did not come into the world to judge the world. He came in order to save the world. That whosoever believes in him might have eternal life. You remember that little verse? Yeah. So he wants, at this point in his ministry, not to muddy the water in my opinion. I think he think, you know, understands that further confrontation is going to be detrimental to the disciple making that his disciples are doing. That's the healthy growth pattern here. See, there's, there's a time to ignore untrustworthy people. Especially if that's a known fact about them. Not just a suspicion. These Pharisees are a known quantity at this point. Jesus has demonstrated that in his ministry already. You remember that little section that says, uh, and Jesus, knowing what was in the hearts of all men, did not entrust himself to them. Believers. Untrustworthy. Immature. New believers. Well, these guys aren't even believers, as far as I can tell. So he moves location. It's exactly opposite of what we would expect of a, of a Jewish man of some standing, of some note, especially maybe one coming home from the Passover in a ceremonially clean state. Yeah? We don't talk, we don't talk about ceremonially clean or unclean. It's not part of our understanding. We, we understand that we are cleansed, right? We are in Christ. We are declared righteous. We are holy, we were accepted, we were reconciled, but 
jump. He had to go through Samaria. Exactly opposite. If you asked a, a Jewish guy and you said, what is it that you have to do in relation to Samaria? What is it that you have to do when it comes to the Samaritan? I say, well, if we run across a Samaritan, we have to cross the street. If we are headed towards Samaria, we have to go around. <laughs> we have to avoid those dirty dogs. Kind of like telling a Texan he had to go to New York or California. I don't know why I don't. In fact, I have to maybe do something otherwise. It's true, isn't it? Californians all feel like they have to go here. It tells me something. I don't think so. No one, no Jewish person would go through that nasty place. <laughs> you know, the problem with Samaria is there's a lot of Samaritans there. <laughs> well, let's just let it stand that the Samaritans... The Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. It's a long-standing feud that they had. Uh, by the way, we're not sure exactly. I mean, we, we kind of have an inkling of what, what's going on there. But you know this. How many of y'all have big families? Everybody, I got a big family. I got hillbillies on one side, rednecks on the other. We got big families. Who fights the best? You're not going to answer that out loud, are you? This is being recorded, so don't say your name. <laughs> Who fights best? Family. Don't they? Not best in an admirable way. I'm just saying, who fights the hardest, the nastiest? Who goes for the jugular? Who pushes the buttons? Family, right? Now, the Samaritans were... Largely Jewish, as a matter of fact. They were descended from the northern kingdom tribes. We think of Ephraim and Manasseh, specifically. Uh, maybe this is what the Jewish people held against them, that they didn't go into exile when the rest of the nation went. They stayed in the land. That might make them upset. Why did they get to stay and we had to leave? Why did we get dragged into captivity? And these people got to stay and keep their, their homes and, and their vineyards and their land. They intermarried with Gentiles. They, they developed a, a, do you know the word syncret, syncretic, syncretistic religion? They, they joined the Canaanite religions with their Judaism religion. They mushed, mushed it all together. Really not tons worse than the rest of Israel, quite honestly. That, that's why they went into exile. It wasn't a ton worse than what the rest of the northern kingdom had done. You remember that story, right? They, they set up golden calves as if the golden calf had never caused them a problem before. <laughs> Jeroboam set up two shrines, two golden calves on either side so that people wouldn't be inconvenienced to go worship the one true God, creator of heaven and earth in Jerusalem. So wouldn't have to drive too far. Because it wasn't comfortable. Or convenient or nice. Just worship these golden calves. We'll call it good. It'll buff out. Not a whole lot worse. Looking at it from the outside and thousands of years later, I kind of wonder if they didn't just hold it against them that they didn't go into exile. I don't know. They got to stay. They're, cl they're really closer than cousins. They're family, tight, biologically. Here's the thing to keep in mind, though, that whether the, the other Jews, the, the Jewish leadership in Judea specifically, hated them or not, Jesus didn't. Jesus did not hate them. And in fact, he considered them Jewish. You know how I know that? No? Any guesses? We can talk. We're still humans here, right? We didn't shed that. We... Jesus was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
In fact, Scripture records a Canaanite woman coming to him and, and asking him for a miracle of healing. And he says, I didn't come to you. I came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she responds. And she says, look, even the, even the puppies, the baby puppies under the table get the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus granted her request. But when John records that Jesus had to go to Samaria, that says that's part of his purpose. That's part of his mission, is to go to Samaria, this Messiah who was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's in Matthew 15, 24, by the way, if you want to read that story. He had to. Now, a fringe benefit was likely that the Pharisees wouldn't be caught dead following him into Samaria. That, but that, that's a sideline. That's a fringe benefit. That's free, right? That was his purpose. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, about lunchtime. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. It's like the hottest part of the day. Come draw water. Or close to it. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So they, they come to this city called Sychar in, in Samaria near Jacob's well, land that was given to Joseph. By the way, does God give land to the Jewish people temporarily? No, right? That's their permanent possession. You could call it Israel's well. That, that's what God changed Jacob's name to. You remember that. This is near the parcel of land Israel gave to his son, Joseph who in turn would have passed it to Ephraim and Manasseh, his sons. He received a double portion because of his blessing. And you know the story. The disciples went into town to get food. Got to eat. But here we, we see a theme introduced that is carried throughout this, this chapter, the theme of food versus water, water versus food. Uh, Jesus is virtually sitting on top of a well. <laughs> He's sitting next to it. I'm sure there was some seating there. This was a community well. But it's not one of those that you can't just dip it out with your hand. And he has to ask, or maybe he doesn't have to, but he does. He asks this woman from Samaria for a drink. He's waiting on food. right in front of a well. And yet, he's to ask for a drink. This is surprising to her. Well, the, the Jewish opinion of Samaritan women was that they were always ceremonially unclean. Always. You, you could not contact a Samaritan woman as a Jewish man without being unclean yourself. You would then have to go and go through the cleansing rituals at the temple go through all of that and appear before the priest and be declared ceremonially clean again. It says in, in verse 9, Therefore the Samaritan woman to him, said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, objectively speaking, remember, these are, this is family. This is a family disagreement. There is a rift between them, the Samaritans and the Jews. They had no dealings with each other. She's incredulous. Now, I'm not sure that we can exactly appreciate how incredulous she is when she says, how is it that you even address me? I am a Samaritan, hello, and I'm a woman. Y'all have heard the prayer, right? Thank God I wasn't born a Gentile or a woman. That was actual, an actual Jewish prayer by a Jewish man, that I wasn't born a Gentile or a woman. Doesn't sound very contemporarily you know, appropriate. 
Most people would think I'm an ana- walking anachronism anyway, so I don't mind telling you what they actually said. especially a Jewish man, a Jewish rabbi, somebody who is outstripping John the baptizer in disciple-making, who has a legitimate movement of people that is assembling around him to, to even speak with her, much less to have indirect contact with her. The closest thing I can think of is, uh, if you've ever been, I think in Dallas and San Antonio, there's still a vestige of a water fountain in the, in the courthouse there. And above that, if you can just make it out, it says whites only. Still, it has a plaque next to it that says this is why we left it here. On a smaller scale, why we don't tear down things like Auschwitz. Because we dare not forget that that actually happened. That was actually there. That hate extended down to the use of silly things like water fountains. I think both Dallas and San Antonio have something like that. No dealings, no conversations, no proximity, nothing between them. So Jesus answered. And said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, Israel. Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Hint, hint. Samaritan woman, though, Jesus says, you need to be asking some questions. Who is this guy? This Jewish rabbi guy sitting out by himself in the middle of the desert? Y'all have heard that, right? The fence post turtle? (laughs) Have you ever heard about the fence post turtle? The saying is, if you're driving along in South Texas and you see a turtle on a fence post, you know something. Somebody put him there for a purpose. Because he didn't get there by himself. There's a purpose for him to be there. Jesus is there with a purpose. A God-ordained purpose. Who is this guy, this Jewish guy? He's obviously Jewish. And from Galilee, obviously. What is the gift of God? What gift of God am I to? And, and actually, a third question, may I have some living water? Because that sounds pretty good. Like when your teacher gives you the question, y'all had teachers like this, right? You had some mean ones who tested you on stuff they didn't teach, expected you to absorb it, right? Yes? No? Yeah, Jacob has. Yeah, the meaning one. Yeah, I'm sure that it, we've all had mean ones. We have. We have some other softy ones that are like, here is letter C on question number three. Here's the question. Here's the answer. And if you're not snoozing, you ought to get that question right, right? Jesus is giving her the the questions to ask. Ask these questions. You're going to like the answers, Samaritan woman. She's still thinking about the water. About the task at hand, because it's hard work. I I spent about a year and a half hauling about five to six thousand gallons of water a month, 425 gallons at a time. You don't have a life if you're doing that, by the way. Your Saturdays are gone, your Sunday afternoons are gone, your pipes freeze, you're out of luck. Having to haul water every day is miserable. And she was doing it in the center of the day. We find out probably why a little later, not with the crowd. It wasn't a fellowship opportunity. It wasn't the women's Bible study. And this probably wasn't Tuesday morning. By the way, you all want to come to that. It's way better than hauling water in the middle of the day. She needs to get this done quickly. 
and living water. By the way, this was, this was a phrase we actually still use today. Living water is way better than drawing it out of a well, live water, isn't it? See, we need to know that living water didn't have just one meaning back then. It wasn't just a theological thing, right? If, if y'all have ever spent any time looking at ranches, yeah? No? See, the difference between a cheap ranch <laughs> and an expensive ranch over here is what we call live water. You ever heard that? No? Live water. We don't have a lot of ranches with live water around here. <laughs> Uh, but down in, in the hill country in the central Texas, you can, you, you, same ranch basically, 200 acres here, 200 acres there. This one has a, an artesian spring under natural pressure. It just bubbles forth living water. This one just has an arroyo sort of thing where it just collects water sometimes. One's way more valuable than the other. That's what it kind of meant. Running water. Healthy water. Easier to get water out of when it jumps into the jar by itself. Yeah? I actually had something like this happen last week. While I was gone, my wife called me up and she said, there, are, there is a massive swarm of bees on the front of one of your empty boxes. I said, wow, don't bother them. You know, those bees just moved right in. It was the easiest swarm capture I've ever done. Because it filled up the box itself. If the jar fills itself up from the spring, that's easy. That's what she wants to know. She wants to know, where can I go that the water will load itself in the jar? It's easy. So her question is valid. If we have living water around here somewhere, Jesus, let me know. But if we have living water, Jesus, why are you asking me for a drink? It does not compute. He said, but you're not greater than Jacob, are you? You're not greater than our ancestor, our patriarch, our father, Israel. It would be offensive to every Pharisee that ever dared to hear that, wouldn't it? He dug the well. It had been serviceable all this time. Millennia. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Y'all know, when I was in real estate, there were, there were million-dollar homes out in the near hill country of San Antonio that were flushing their toilets with pool water. Less than 10 years old, and the wells were dry in the middle of that terrible drought. You had a million dollar home, you expect to have to haul water in from your swimming pool to do that? Mm. See, wells aren't eternal. This is a pretty good well. It was pretty deep, pretty fresh, pretty clean. It was a blessing. It was intended to be a rhetorical question. I know you're not greater than Jacob. Don't blow smoke. He's the patriarch. That's why we call him the patriarch. He's ark. He's higher. He's the forefather. He's, he, he rules over all the other guys. Jesus and answered, and said, answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. I once had a guy, this is the joys of pastoral ministry. One of them. I once had a guy who thought because I was a pastor, I would really want to know, I would really want to possess the ability to make God's water in my house. You thought you had God's water in your house, didn't you? Everybody has running water, right? Yes. You think you have the water the way God made it? In this guy's opinion, nobody without his machine had God's water in his house. Oh, this is over in New Braunfels. Uh, and I've had, he had this real prima donna attitude. We met for lunch, and I asked for water with my barbecue, and he went, oh, I guess I'll have water. Boy, 
the sails are deep with this one, right? He's, well, he's got it down. So he gets his glass of water, and he takes a big sip, and I'm sipping away, and I'm thinking, man, this is good old hill country water coming through the aquifer. It's you know, nice natural filter, what I grew up with, nice. He said, this water just doesn't seem wet. <laughs> well, let me pour it over your head and see how wet it is, you turkey. This water doesn't seem as wet as it should. It's my water from home. He carried his own water around in a little black jug most of the time. So the sun didn't get it. Especially. I kind of wonder if Jesus didn't sound like that guy to the Samaritan woman in that moment. Listen, lady, this water isn't as wet <laughs> as the water I've got. Because you can drink this water and get it only once. You'll never thirst again. And she's still thinking about water. H2O. Drink the water once, Jesus says, and never thirst again. Drink the water once, and the well springs up inside of you unto eternal life. One sip. That answers a lot of questions people have. Pretty profound statement. A lot of people say, well, yeah, you could believe once. I'm not sure it's stuck. I've actually had people say that about their own child. Yes, he made a profession of faith when he was seven, but we're waiting to see if it's stuck. It's not what Jesus said at all. You drink the water once, never thirst again. You don't have to keep drinking the water. Ever. Never. Once. How many times is once? Y'all aren't too good at math, are you? I'm going to say this slowly. How many times is once? One. I don't have a math degree either. I have compassion on you. They don't teach that at seminary. Didn't even take one in undergrad. Can you believe that? I placed out of that puppy and ran like I stole it. I didn't even sign up for another math class. None of us expect to drink water and never drink water again. But Jesus says, this, this living water installs its own well in your guts, like on your inner, inward parts. It springs up a well of eternal life. So can you believe in just a moment and never believe again and have eternal life? Yeah. That's the idea. That's the plan. That's why it's like nothing else. Drink the water once, you're good, forever, for eternity. What about this sin or that sin, Pastor? What about obedience or disobedience? Doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter for this discussion. We'll get to why it matters. It does matter. Sin is bad for you. Ruins your life. Ruins other people's lives. As I told several key family members as a young, budding preacher, sin has victims. And yours did. It's a short way to get uninvited to somebody's house. It wasn't untrue. Nor was it precisely unkind in that context, but it did happen. So it does matter. But obedience, disobedience, sin, not sin, that's not the issue. Once you've drunk the water, can, is there anything else that you can do to undrink the water? Have you ever... No? Are you sure? You know what happens to water when you drink it? It becomes you. Y'all do know that, right? You watch Saturday morning cartoons in the 90s, some of you at least. You, you saw the little commercials in between that talked about how much of a percentage you are of water. It becomes part of you. You drink the water once. You, don't, you can't undrink the water. 
Period. It springs up to eternal life. Never to thirst again. Never. One sip, one drink. Now remember the theme throughout this chapter. Water versus food. We'll get there. Food is not water. Water is not food. We wouldn't ought not to confuse those in here. But one who drinks the water, the living water, never thirsts again. 